Um, kia ora everyone. Uh, welcome to Clearhead's uh, webinar. Um, and so before we kick off, uh, just a bunch of uh, simple housekeeping rules. Uh, <laughs> it looks like Michael has... Um, uh, so it's on the it's on the chat you will see uh, some instructions on how to engage with us. You don't have to worry about being seen or heard. Uh, that's all uh, sorted. And uh, Michael will switch off his his mobile phone um, and obviously start his audio recording as well. <laughs> Um, sorry about that, guys. Um, but yeah, so um, we'd love to uh, receive questions from you. I will feed them um, in the second half of the webinar. Um, and as if you can really engage with um, what uh, Michael is saying, please uh, feel free to react um, on, on the webinar. And uh, as, we, as we sort of said, um, you don't have to worry about it. So with that, uh, I will kick off. Um, with uh, the introduction. So my name is Angela. Uh, I'm a medical doctor and a co-founder of Clearhead, uh, where we are an innovative EAP provider, um, ensuring that you are supported where you need uh, and how you need to be supported. Clear the Air is a podcast covering the questions in your life that um, is too hard for you to share about. And we speak with experts to share the science behind what you're experiencing and explore the answers to those questions. Now, I'm super excited about introducing our guest, Michael Bungay Stenia. Is that how I would say your, your okay. name, Michael? Couldn't okay. have said it better, Perfect. Angela. That was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So Michael Bungay Stenia is a Rhodes Scholar at the forefront of shaping how organizations around the world become more coach-like as an essential leadership competency. He founded Box of Crayons, a learning and development company that helps organizations move from... Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I might start that again just because I didn't click on my audio recording. Sorry, guys. Um, so I'm very proud to be able to introduce our special guest today, Michael Bangay Stenier. He's a Rhodes Scholar at the forefront of shaping how organizations around the world become more coach-like as an essential leadership competency. He founded Box of Crayons, a learning and development company that helps organizations move from advice-driven to curiosity-led. They've trained hundreds of thousands of managers to be more coach-like, and their clients range from Microsoft to Salesforce to Gucci. His book, The Coaching Habit, is the best-selling coaching book of this century. In 2019, he was named the number one thought leader in coaching, and his latest book, How to Begin, helps people be ambitious for themselves and for the world and find their worthy goal and start something thrilling, important, and daunting. And in fact, his first published piece of writing was a Harlequin romance story involving a misdelivered letter. And it's called The Mail Delivery and Mail being spelled M-A-L-E. <laughs> so with all that cheekiness, welcome, Michael. Uh, look, thank you, Angela. It's nice to be here. Wonderful. Well, maybe um, you could share a little bit with us um, what made you start uh, being down this path of coaching people to be a coach and in fact I didn't say you you even uh managed to um coach uh Brene Brown a little bit and she's obviously known as the renowned coach on vulnerability yes that's right you know it started for me when I was a teenager um I found myself having conversations with my friends you know people my age and going through this, the normal struggles of a teenager you know who am I what's my identity why am I rejected? Why can't I get a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever it might be? And I found myself in those conversations and listening to people and thinking to myself, I just don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> I, maybe talking is helping. Maybe talking isn't helping. Maybe could I be doing a better job or a different job in terms of how to have that conversation? And so I went and trained on the youth crisis phone line in Canberra, where I grew up in Australia. Um, we have a, a national uh, crisis line called Lifeline. The only time you're feeling suicidal or troubled or having a hard time of it, you can call Lifeline. And Youthline is designed for young people. So I trained on that. And that for me was the first realization that there's, um, you can have a structure to a conversation that can help people feel safe 
and where the vulnerability is welcomed and you can offer support and understanding without having necessarily to offer up answers. So that was the seed getting planted. And I did that through university, first in Australia, then in England. And when I was living in England, uh, the kind of coaching began to be a thing. This is in the 1990s, I guess. And I was like, oh, it's all coming from California and California is full of woo-woo crazy people. So I was a bit skeptical because I was living in London, the most skeptical city in the entire world. But when I moved from London to, to uh, the US to Boston, I actually hired somebody to be my coach. And that was the start of my journey to get trained as a coach and to build up a coaching practice. But then I discovered that, you know, the thing I love doing most of all is not coaching people, it's teaching people. So I was frustrated about coaching feeling still a bit inaccessible and a bit privileged for people. So that's when I went on this journey to go, how do I make coaching unweird and make it feel like it's an everyday tool for just normal people as well? That's great. Maybe I guess that's a good segue to maybe tell us a little bit about what is coaching and how do you apply that in the context of everyday people? And then how do you apply that in the context when it's more managers and people leaders? Yeah, look, it's a great question. What's coaching? Because I'm not sure anybody has a very good answer, or at least everybody has a good answer, but it's quite different from everybody else's answer. So coaching is one of those words that most people have now heard of. But, you know, are we? is it sports coaching? And is that the same as life coaching? And is that the same as executive coaching? And is that the same as ADHD coaching? And is that the same as youth coaching? And is that the same as parental coaching? I mean, now there's all these different niches. So you can define, a definition can be about the outcome or it can be about the process. So often for an outcome, the goal of coaching is help people to have a better life, whatever that might be. So sometimes it's about amplifying the good. Sometimes it's about getting clear on the choices that you want to make towards your, your better life. Sometimes it's about managing the stuff that's a, a struggle for you, that's difficult right now. That's the outcome. I tend to define coaching more as a process because I'm trying to teach people how to do that. And you can't control outcomes, but you can control your process. So if you're trying to be a coach, or as I would like to put it, to be more coach-like, because you don't have to be a coach to use the power of coaching. So being more coach-like, for me, that means, can you stay curious a little bit longer? Can you rush to action and advice giving a little bit more slowly? Because most people are advice giving maniacs. I mean, they think that they've been trained all their life to be the person with the idea. I mean, you know, you're trained as a doctor, you've spent 800 years learning stuff and being tested on stuff and having the information. And there's some research that says doctors, uh, GPs, general practitioners, interrupt their patients on average 17 seconds into the conversation. And I've always thought that that is a bit harsh on doctors because I think most of us interrupt people about 17 seconds into a conversation because as soon as somebody starts talking, your advice monster comes up out of the dark and goes, oh, let me offer you some advice. Let me give you some ideas and opinions, suggestions, points of view, whatever. And there is a place for advice for sure. But being more coach-like means staying curious a little bit longer, rushing to action and advice giving a little bit more slowly. So before you give your advice, why don't you find out a little bit more about what's going on and what really matters and what the real challenge is so that when you get your advice, it's the best possible advice. Uh, yeah, and I think I passed the test. I did not interrupt you um, within that 17 seconds. Well done. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think, look, the, the, what you've mentioned is all true. We are actually very bad at being active listeners, and that's something that uh, we believe if you want to be a good manager, it's a really key part of what yeah. it means to do that. Uh, and, and of course, there are many times where you, you hear partners complain that they, you know, they just wanted to vet and here it is, their partners giving them advice and they actually want to just be listened to. Because often yeah. these problems cannot be solved overnight. And so um, just as an advice, uh, if you find yourself 
often interrupting, you know, practice mindfulness. You know, um, if you find that you're, you're, you're just waiting to give the response, listen to, you know, like take a breath, um, focus yeah. on that um, before you kind of say whatever is in your mind. You actually listen rather than wait for your turn to reply. Um, well, maybe, um, well, you know, sort of, maybe you could share with us, you know, you, you talked about the outcome is to kind of live a better life. Um, and when we chatted last, you said there were three main reasons that people are unhappy in their jobs. And our jobs are sort of one of the key uh, parts yeah. of our lives. So do you want to maybe share with us some of the challenges that people face and how right. they're introducing this coach-like uh, concept and process you've talked about uh, yeah. can help them address that? Yeah, look, um, for many of us, work is a really big part of our lives. You know, even if you don't like work and you're doing it just to get the cash, it's still 35 hours a week probably if you're working full time. And for many people and probably the people who listen to this podcast in particular, work is not just a way of getting cash. It's a source of meaning as well. You're like, I get something out of it. At its best, I, you know, work matters to me and I'm not just doing it for the money. I'm doing it for a sense of purpose and a sense of meaning. So I think there are three things that determine whether you're having a good time at work or not. First is this, are you working on something that matters? You know, do you have a goal or goals that you and your team are working towards that you're like, I actually care about this. I've got some skin in the game around that. So purpose and stuff that matters. Secondly, what's your relationship like with the key people that you work with? You know, your boss is the most obvious, but there are other key relationships you have. Does that relationship suck or does it help you flourish? You know, there's a well-known saying, people uh, join organizations but leave managers. So if, you have an, if you've got a bad relationship with your manager, then you're not going to be having a good time. And then the third thing is, are you making progress in the work that you're doing? And I think coaching can help with all three of these. Coaching can help build a better relationship with your boss. Coaching can help you figure out what's the work you want to be focused on because most of us have too much stuff going on. There's a thousand different demands on your time and attention at work. So you're being pulled one way or the other. And then coaching is also very much about, are you making progress on the stuff that matters? That's really great. I mean, based on Clearhead's data, um, that is uh, those three things around um, purpose, relationship, uh, and prioritization slash progress are all mm -hmm. things that we find uh, is one of the top few reasons that often causes um, poor well-being in the workplace. Yeah, um, yeah. Can you maybe share with us a little bit around how you've worked with these managers? Like you said, you've through your company, you've worked with thousands, you've written the books. Yeah. How have you worked through all of these three or four things that you've just mentioned? Yeah. You know, talk us through some of the uh, outcomes you've been able to achieve and, sure. and the process that got you there. Yeah, you know, Probably our, our, our biggest client, our best known client is uh, Microsoft. And we've worked with them specifically around helping them make coaching a more foundational skill to the work that they do, including we've done a, a fair bit of work with Microsoft New Zealand. I mean, just earlier this year, I was in New Zealand and I was hanging out with the CEO of Microsoft New Zealand, who she's a dynamic keynote speaker as well. So it's nice to have that kind of antipathy and connection. So one of the things that is terrific about Microsoft is uh, Satya Nadella, who's been the CEO now there for 10 years or thereabouts, uh, he really has overseen a shift in that company. When he took it on, Microsoft was a bit of a joke. You know, it's like Apple, cool. Microsoft, not very cool. You know, Facebook, cool then obviously not now or twitter call then not so much now microsoft you know it's just a kind of boring place that does you know word documents that's a gross oversimplification anybody who's from microsoft i apologize but when such a nadella came in he's like we are going to shift our culture from a know-it-all culture to a learn-it-all culture so the heart of his work is Carol Dweck's insight around the growth mindset. And it's like, you know what? We, for us to thrive as an organization, we need to shift our business model. We need to sell different stuff and sell it in a different way. 
but we also need to shift our culture as well. So we've had the pleasure of now working with Microsoft for, I think uh, we're just about to enter our fifth year working with them, um, training managers and leaders and individual contributors around the world to shift the way that they work with people. Because when you are staying curious a little bit longer and it feels like an actual useful thing that you're doing, you're doing a couple of things, the, the kind of the twin DNA of any successful organization. You're helping focus on the stuff that matters because no matter where you fit in the hierarchy, you've got too much stuff. There's too much stuff coming at you and you can spend a lot of time working on the stuff that is not most important. And one of the most critical questions is, what's the real challenge here? What's the real challenge here for you? When you start asking that question, you start figuring out what do we actually need to put our time and attention to. But when you're coaching somebody, something perhaps a little more subtle is happening, which is there is a shift towards where responsibility and accountability lies. And you're actually saying, I'm going to trust you to figure this stuff out yourself. I'm going to trust you to take responsibility for the work that's yours to take responsibility for. There's a way that accountability and trust and responsibility is pushed lower down into the organization. And what that does is it contributes to culture. So now, not only are you more likely to be working on the stuff that matters, but you're more likely to be keeping the good people who are working on the stuff that matters. And so you build strategy and you build culture. That's great. And when we, you sort of, you know, you sort of said that the first question you asked is what's the real challenge here? When we last spoke, you mentioned that there's actually seven questions you asked yeah. to lead people down this path. Do you want to maybe share with us that those seven questions that helps drive the type of culture that yeah. you've described and created, basically? Well, I'm not going to share all seven because it becomes a bit of a boring list, but let me share some of those. So you've heard one of them, which is the focus question. What's the real challenge here for you? And I'll show you how you can combine that with the second question, what I often call the best coaching question in the world, and what else? Because and what else recognizes that their first answer is not their only answer and not necessarily their best answer. So when somebody comes to you and goes, blah, 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 and there's one part of you that wants to leap in with advice and solutions and suggestions because you're a good person and you're just trying to help, well, you could go, it's like, okay, so there's a lot going on for you, Angela. What's the real challenge here for you, do you think? And Angela will go, ah, okay, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, fantastic. What else? What else is a challenge here for you? And then I'll go, what else is a challenge here for you? And then I'll lean in a little closer. I'll go, okay, so what's the real challenge here for you? And you can see what I've done is I've just asked the same question basically four times, but I've done it in a way with genuine curiosity. I'm being lazy. I'm not working too hard. I'm just managing my own anxiety about not sharing my answers and my solutions. Angela, on the other hand, is sweating it because she's having to do all the work now. She's really working hard to make this happen. So that combination, what's the real challenge here for you and, and, and what else is a really nice combo. The second the combo I want to share with you, and maybe we'll leave it at this after I've shared this combo, is how to start and how to finish a coaching conversation. Because like with anything, people go, you know, once I get into it, I'm fine, but how do I get into it? And then they go, but once, once I'm into it, I'm fine, but how do I finish it so it doesn't kind of trail off? So I call these the bookend questions. Question number one and question number seven in the Coaching Habit book. The coaching number, question number one is the, uh, the kickstart question. And the kickstart question is simply and powerfully, what's on your mind? What's on your mind? And I know you know that question because it's the question Facebook use when they start their, uh, you know, asking you to post. But what's on your mind says, all right, let's have a conversation, you and me. Don't tell me everything. Don't report out on anything. Let's get into it. Let's talk about the stuff that matters most to you. You know, what's on your mind says, tell me what you're excited about or worried about or struggling with or wrestling with right now. Let's get into the real juicy stuff as fast as possible. So the kickstart question is how to start many conversations. 
And then the learning question is how you might want to finish it. And the learning question is, what was most useful or most valuable here for you? And I'll share what I mean by that, why this is helpful. You know, Angela and I have been talking for 20 minutes now, thereabouts. You've heard me say a bunch of things. Angela said a bunch of things. Your, your brain is already full. <laughs> you know, after, honestly, after seven minutes, your brain is full unless you've processed it in some way, cleared it in some way. So at this stage, it's a little bit like pouring water into a full cup. You know, I'm just, I'm saying all these amazing things and your brain can't even take it in anymore. But if I say to you, okay, just pause for a moment. Like, obviously, Angela's been brilliant and I'm doing my best. Um, but what's been most useful or most valuable for you so far from this conversation in this podcast? You know, is it the questions? Is it the definition of coaching? Is it my story? Is it my interesting background? I mean, who knows what you've taken away from what was most interesting for you? But can you see how me asking the question forces you to crystallize and remember and extract the value from the conversation? And so many good conversations happen in life and in work where the, 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 the gold dust, the pearls of wisdom, the little nuggets of gold are not properly captured. And asking that question, what, what was most useful or most valuable here for you, is a question you can add on to almost any conversation. Talk to your, your team, to your boss, to your peer, to your clients, to customers, to people you're pitching you're going to get some interesting feedback about what's working. That's really great. I think that, you know, and I think what you're trying to say is it's very approachable. You know, I'm like, yes, these, these things are around how do I help my employees unlock purpose in their work? How yeah. do I help them basically prioritize what's important? It's not that I have to write this 10-page strategy. It's actually right. just taking the time to ask simple questions that you've even given us what those questions are. And right. then it's up to us to be able to listen. Um, right. But, you know, you, you did say the whole point of these questions uh, is, is just to unlock unlock uh, ability of self-awareness uh, mm -hmm. and then for these individuals to take responsibility and ownership about whatever challenges that they're going through and ask for help through this process That's but right. we have all also been in situations where uh, we talk and, and try and coach friends or colleagues uh, or uh, those that directly report to us that uh, don't really take that on very well um, and they really resist the coaching or, mm -hmm. or they don't think they have a problem how yeah. do you how do you manage you know what do you do differently in those situations well you're describing some different situations so there's not a generic one size fit all response but um, I think quite often when you say to somebody hey I'm going to coach you now they have an immediate response of kind of going, ah, <laughs> how do I avoid being coached by you? I mean, you go all weird when you coach me. That doesn't work at all. So um, uh, for those people, I just don't announce that I'm coaching. I just stay curious in my conversation. You know, um, part of my deep belief is coaching is an ongoing everyday way of working with people not the occasional interaction. So if once a month I call up Angela and I go, Angela, come into my office. I'm going to coach you. Angela freaks out. <laughs> She's like, oh, God. Once a month I have to do this weird thing with Michael. But if I'm like, hey, Angela, hey, how are you doing? What's on your mind? So what's the real challenge and what else? Okay, so what, what are you going to say yes to and what are you going to say no to to make that work? And if you're going to say yes to this, what's the real challenge of that? So what was most useful? It's like, it's not even a coaching conversation. It's just a coach-like conversation fueled by curiosity. Um, a deeper form of resistance is when you start being curious with the people with whom you work and they go, this isn't good. I thought I trained you to do all the work and have all the answers. Now you're actually pushing it back to me. And they're either going to overcome that and kind of rise to the challenge or if they're like you're you're not doing the work you're you, you've got a manager you who's rescuing them and kind of protecting them from their underperformance well that then invites another conversation about what does it mean to not 
perform and not take responsibility and not be accountable. And how that's dealt with is very much down to individuals and also down to kind of corporate cultures and corporate organizations. Sometimes they get fired. Sometimes they get let go. Sometimes they get trained. Sometimes everybody passively, aggressively ignores it and just hopes that things get better. And sometimes they do and often they don't. Um, and uh, and then I can't remember what the, the third, there was, I had a third scenario that your question had set up in my brain, but I've already forgotten it. So I, No, I, I love to double click on what you've just said. You know, yeah. so let's like, what is the best um, process of outcome you've seen in, in situations where, look, I think it is really hard to manage a team uh, mm. with a mostly remote and hybrid workforce. Um, and then if you do struggle with someone's performance, how do you, how do you support them through the process um, if you're yeah. not, for example, able to see the, 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 the progress that you want? You know, it's not just the progress from the person themselves, but also the progress of the person trying to be coach-like, right? And yeah. so, yeah, I mean, let's, I, I think it's, it's really hard and I think a lot of managers struggle with this. So maybe we'd love to hear a little bit more depth on, sure. on that. So I'm going to say it's hard to manage people, whether you're in person with them or managing them virtually. I mean, virtual has its own trickiness. In-person has its own trickiness as well. It is hard to manage people um, because you're messy and human and they're messy and human. So you have two messy humans showing up, doing the best to try and fulfill goals that are established by other people, typically, your, your organization. So this is a big question, Angela. But... One of the question, one of the things to go is, do we know what success looks like? Like I literally had somebody, I was talking to somebody of my team this morning, and I basically have not successfully or, or, or appropriately set up success goals for her. So she's like, I don't know what's my responsibility and what's not my responsibility. And I'm like, that is true. You don't. And I haven't been clear about that. I just hope they would somehow just magically appear. And uh, funnily enough, they didn't. So until you have a agreed, this is what you're going to be working on and this is what success looks like, it is hard for you to, to figure that out. Secondly, a lot of us resist giving feedback as feedback has its own weight and our own anxiety about how do we have this conversation. So for feedback, I use a, a simple model to help me understand what's going on and what may need to be said. Um, it, it has its origins in nonviolent communication by Marshall Rosenberg. And basically, very quickly, it's this. Everything that's going on falls into one of four different categories. It's either data, in other words, the facts, judgments, your interpretation of the facts, your feelings. And I know Brene Brown has a, an atlas of feelings, but I use five. Mad, sad, glad, ashamed, afraid. And then what do you want or what do you need? Any good conversation has those four elements. And what I do if I'm kind of stressing out about giving feedback is I just get the swirl of stuff that's going on in my brain and put it into those four buckets. What are the facts? What are my opinions? I'll have opinions about them and I'll have opinions about me and I'll have opinions about the situation. How am I feeling? It's often mad, sad not glad, <laughs> ashamed and afraid is often all four of those. And then really importantly, I'm like, what do I, what's the request I want to make? What do I want to ask for? And what I find is that when I get really clear about the request I want to make, the rest of the feedback conversation becomes easier because I like, I know, I know the end point of this. I'm not just telling them bad news for the sake of bad news. I've actually got something to say. I'd like this to be different next time. I'd like you to do this now. This is what's required for you to fix this. So I'd say um, defining success, learning how to give feedback. And the th third element, and I'm still figuring this out because this is my next book. I've got a book coming out in June and I'm just writing it at the moment, is how do you make your relationships with other people more repairable? Because... Every relationship gets damaged. Everything has breaks and cracks in it. And that's not failure. That's just life. <laughs> so
So how do you potentially take the lead to say this relationship matters? What do what does it take for this relationship to get repaired so it can be the best possible relationship? And so often in our working lives, the relationship gets a bit damaged and you don't do anything about it. You just kind of get sad and then you go, well, this just proves it. And when somebody goes, how do we clear this up between you and me? How do we make this relationship clear and clean and transparent? You give both parties the chance to get back to where they were before. That sounds good. Yeah, I think just to maybe quickly summarize what you've mentioned. So basically, you know, there are going to be ch situations where sometimes the people that you're trying to be coached like to might not maybe be receiving it as well. And so mm -hmm. instead of sort of defaulting to advice mode per se, maybe it's just clarity around and and transparency around, you know, yeah. what, what is it that you're trying to achieve? Uh, you know, like be transparent around, okay, well, I actually want to get you to point B. Uh, and uh, my process of getting you from point A to point B is to ask you a series of questions that help me understand what you need, um, what you need from me, what I can do, how can I not, you know, set you up for success, and then keep checking in with you regularly. Um, uh, and then yeah. obviously, uh, you know, and, and sometimes, like you said, the, the relationships uh, might end up being at a point where it's unrepairable. And then, you know, it's, yeah no fault of either party it's just that you know things change and so maybe when you talk about the difficulties that you've just highlighted around how relationships over time do decay unless yeah. we we actively maintain them you know what can people do to actively build and manage better relationships especially when there is sometimes a power dynamic between the manager and and, the, yeah. and even with your colleagues sometimes exactly so the, the first thing I'd just say to add on to what you're saying now is just recognize that coaching is not the only style of leadership. You know, what, you, what can be easy to assume by me going on and on and on about coaching is that I'm like, this is it, make everything coaching. And I'm like, coaching has its place and it is a really underutilized leadership skill um, for most people. And it is not the only leadership skill. Sometimes you need to be directive. Sometimes you need to be democratic. Sometimes you, there's different things that you will draw on depending on the circumstance. Now to answer your question around, so what can you do to make things more repairable? The tool that I've found, well, let me, let me share two things that come to mind. The first is a generous mindset which is to say they're probably doing their best. How do I assume positive intent and use that as a way of stepping forward into the relationship rather than ha what sometimes happens where you're like, see, this proves that they suck and they're, they're plotting against me. Um, right, I'm done with this relationship. So uh, API, assume positive intent, can be really helpful as a basic mindset. But I would say... Um, one of the most powerful ways to make your working relationship repairable is to have a conversation about how will we work together rather than what normally happens is you, you just start and only talk about what will we work on. So it's just like meta conversation. So like if Angela, if I got, came onto your team, I'd sit down and go, Angela, when you've worked with somebody like me in this position before and it's worked really well, what happened? I mean, what did you do and what did they do? What were the contributing factors that made that relationship really come to life? And then, and this is a trickier question, I go, and when you've worked with somebody like me in this position before and it's been pretty mediocre, a bit average, a bit underwhelming, what happened? What did you do? What did I do? And I have both of us answer that question. And what we're doing is we're giving ourselves permission to talk about the relationship, not just talk about the work. And there's something really powerful about being able to come back and go, hey, Angela, this, I'm feeling a bit down about how this whole thing is working. <laughs> Let's not talk about the, the project I'm working on. Let's talk about how you and me are working together. And that is a rare conversation, but it's a powerful conversation if, you're, if you have the courage to do it because it's about putting the health of the relationship as 
you know, into the center of the success that you have. Because I do believe in the end, your the quality of your working relationships determines your happiness and your success. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, maybe just to delve a little bit deeper uh, to the comment you made, you said coaching is actually not the only leadership style in there. Uh, so how do you know, you know, what are the other common leadership styles? When do you use coaching? When do you use the others? Can you maybe elaborate a little bit hmm. on that as well? I can give you a reference. So I'd encourage people to look this up. Um, a guy called Daniel Goleman. If you've heard that name, you'll have heard it because he's, he kind of made emotional intelligence. He popularized the idea of emotional intelligence. And 22 years ago now, in the Harvard Business Review, Daniel Goleman wrote an article called Leadership That Gets Results. And he said this. He said he'd done research, and there are six different styles of leadership. They all have their moments. They all have their, their prizes and punishments, their pros and cons. Coaching was one of the six different styles of leadership. It was the least utilized styles of leadership, even though it was shown to have direct correlation to not only the culture but also an engagement, but also to bottom line profit success. I'm not sure I can remember that all six of them, but you know at least one is kind of basically autocratic. I'm going to just tell you what to do. I don't even care what you're thinking or what your opinion is. And that can be brilliant. Like if that, like some years ago, I was running some training in, in a building and um, there was an earthquake <laughs> and the whole room looked at me. And this was not the time for me to start asking questions about what's the real challenge here and how are we all feeling. This is the time for me to say, everybody get up, leave your stuff behind, exit out the door calmly, and we're going to get outside so that we're not in a building that's falling down because of an earthquake. It was a very directive, very clear, pretty autocratic style of leadership. And then there's like democratic. You're like, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to manage the group's opinion and we're going, to, we're going to vote on it and the group gets to decide on how we do it. And then there's a style, I'm not sure what the label is, where you're like, I'm getting everybody's opinion but I get to make the final decision on this. This is my, my decision, my choice. And all of these different styles of leadership, they all have their moment. They all have their pros and cons. And what Goldman's research found is that the typical leader uses two, maybe three of those six styles of leadership, but the most successful leaders know how to use all six at the appropriate time. Great. And from your perspective, when is the best time to use coaching as a leadership style? Well, I think, so you've got confirmation bias here having, which is like, I've got a lot invested in that bit, the power of curiosity. So, you know, you can take, take this or answer or leave it as you see best. But I think there's very little lost and often a lot gained by assuming most conversations are best started with a question rather than a statement. Because even if in the end you need to shift from curiosity to decision-making, it's easier to do it in that order rather than go from decision-making to curiosity. It's kind of like it's that there's a natural order for things. And if you're like, okay, I need to, I, I'm going to make the decision on this topic but before I make my decision, let me just ask you, Angela, what, what do you think the real challenge is here for you and for us? And I can still ask questions that will then allow me to set me up to make the best possible choice. Nice. And then, so I think what you're saying is it's almost a little bit like a spectrum um, exactly. depending on how much time, I guess, you have and, and um, how much. That's, uh, why, that's why my definition of coaching is can you stay curious just a little bit longer? It's not only stay curious. It's not never give advice. It's like, just stretch it out. You know, a minute or two minutes curiosity can take you into a really interesting place. Awesome. Well, um, you know, I want to sort of just uh, open the space up for anyone in, who's listening in who have questions for Michael, please drop them uh, in the chat uh, or in the questions bar. Uh, if not, um, I'll ask one final question. Um, uh, and if there's no other questions, we'll close it off from here. Uh, so, Michael, you know, um, 
one of the other final things that we talked about um, together was some of the challenges that people are facing in the workplace that coaching can help with is that mm -hmm. they there's this trend around sort of people feeling unappreciated, especially mm -hmm. for the younger generation is what we see. So when we, look, when we segmented our data, um, we saw that basically people, uh, there was a generational difference uh, and mm -hmm. that the younger generations do feel more unappreciated in the workplace. And, and then there's sort of this tension where, um, you know, like there's, there's memes that basically sort of say, well, you know, you don't need a pet for, <laughs> for doing your job all the time. So be keen yeah. to hear your thoughts on how, you, you know, this thing around how do you ensure appropriate appreciation and, and people feeling valued and rewarded and recognized, you know, mm -hmm. and, and what's, uh, what do you've learned through coaching all these people manager on, on yeah. building those relationships through, through, through appreciation? It, it is it is a tricky thing to navigate because I, you know, I'm now old enough where I'm like, okay, just, I'm not, do I need to give you a pat and appreciation for every single thing that you do for sure? And I'm pretty naturally wired to be very appreciative of people. Like I am pretty optimistic and pretty positive in the way that I lead my teams. So I'm not totally sure. I think this is one of the, reasons you have this um, conversation about how should we work well together because in writing this new book one of the books I rediscovered was uh, Gary Chapman's book called The Five Love Languages I don't know if you've come across that before but when I first heard about it I was, I was like this sounds like the worst of Californian woo-woo-ness like uh, five different love languages <laughs> throwing up a little bit in my mouth even thinking about it but then I read the book and I was like this is actually really helpful because there are five different ways that you can you you can appreciate somebody and I'm going to forget them but it's like some of them are words of praise some of them are gifts some of them are touch some of them are acts of service some of them there's maybe there's a, there's a fifth one as well maybe that's money or maybe that's gifts and money are the same I can't remember and it turns out that knowing how somebody likes to be appreciated makes it much easier to appreciate somebody. You know, there are some people who just don't get that excited by words of appreciation. So it doesn't matter. I go, Angela, you're amazing. This is fantastic. You're fantastic. The work you do is fantastic. We are fantastic. They're like, nah. <laughs> it's not really striking, striking a chord for them. But if I go, let, let me, I, I've organized for a, mess, a masseuse to come to your house and give you a massage as an act of appreciation. They're like, oh my God, that was amazing. Because it's a different, they have a different love language, a different way of being appreciated. So I would say two things. First is when you have that conversation about how do we work together, you can have a conversation about how do you like to be appreciated? What does that mean to you? And secondly, know their love language so that when you do appreciate somebody, you have a better chance of it actually striking your chord. Um, great. Yeah. And just to kind of let sort of mention what the five love languages are, they are words of affirmation, acts of service, receiving gifts, quality time, and physical touch. So it's yeah, probably a good thing that you yeah, it's go. probably a Thing that you forgot the last one because we don't want to encourage any sort of sexual harassment um, right, in the exactly. workplace. Right, appropriate physical touch. Yeah. <laughs> appropriate physical touch. Um, you know, that it's been a great conversation so far. Is there anything else you'd like to share from your learnings um, uh, that uh, has me, not been shared yet? Let me pick up Anthony's question. What's your advice for coaching somebody who resists coaching and strictly wants advice, and particularly somebody who strictly wants advice? Because it's, the, it's often the easiest trigger to stop us staying curious when somebody comes up and goes, hey, Michael, how do I dot, dot, dot? And instantly there's some part of your brain going, just give them the answer. They literally ask for you for the answer. Give it to them. And I would, I would give you a script for how I, I respond to something like that. I go, hey, uh, Anthony, thank, great question. I, I know we want to figure this out. I've got some ideas. And I promise you I'll share with you my ideas on how to get this done. But before I give you my ideas, just let me ask you this. What's your best idea so far on how to deal with this? 
And then you go, great. And what? And what else? Great. And what else? Great. What else could you do? This is Anthony. You're doing great. What else could you do? <laughs> now, that assumes that it's a somewhat more complex thing. If they come to you and they go, hey, Michael, where's the folder for the thing? They're like, just tell them where the folder is. <laughs> Sometimes advice is the right thing to do. You're like, you're not going to go, hey, how do you feel about the folder? And if you had to guess where the folder is, where would you guess? And where else could you guess? And what, how else could you find the folder? That's just annoying. So, you know, back to that six different leadership styles, know the six different styles, use them appropriately. But when somebody comes to advice, I often do a little jujitsu and I go, I'll give you advice, I promise. I'll give you my best thoughts. But before I do, tell me what ideas you've already figured out. What do you already know? Uh, great. And um, any final things that you'd like to share before I close it up? I think we've covered a lot in our time together. So I think I've got, um, if you're happy, I'm happy. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, and uh, so maybe just to also uh, share the six leadership styles are authoritative, affiliative, democratic, pace setting, coercive, and of course, coaching, uh, okay. which people can look up after as well. Um, well, we like to close off with our guests asking them one simple question of what do you do to stay well? Um, would you like to share with me uh, what that is, Michael? <laughs> What's well, your one well-being moment, thing? <laughs> mo so I, I love playing soccer. I grew up playing soccer. I'm now 54. So I move even slower than I did as a young man. I've had assorted injuries for a year and a half. So on Sunday, I finally got back and played soccer for the first time in literally a year and some months. And I managed to pull a muscle within the first 10 minutes. So at the moment, the way I manage my well-being is I attempt to recover from assorted old man injuries. <laughs> well, um well, pace yourself, I think, as you say. <laughs> I, was, um, I, was, I wasn't even running. I was literally just walking along and oh, my, no. uh, my right calf muscle went twang. Oh, Very dear. Very disappointing. <laughs> Well, I hope that you uh, you have a speedy recovery and thank you everyone for joining us and, and Michael for being here as our guest. Uh, so wishing everyone a very lovely day and thank you everyone. Bye. Bye everybody. Thanks for having me, Angela. Bye.